Hi, everybody. This is Erica Mello and Susan Clinton, and welcome to episode number 131 of Tough to Treat. Uh, how are you, Susan? I'm good, Erica. Just a couple things before we dive into the episode. Uh, if you have, if you love our podcast, and we certainly love doing this, <laughs> um, please leave us a review on wherever you listen to to podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, any any YouTube, uh, any any place. Uh, we would really appreciate it. It really helps us with the algorithm. It helps people find us on, uh, especially in iTunes. So we would love to read your testimonials. And if you have not left one already, and if you have, thank you so much. We tr so truly appreciate it. And if you are not uh, a member of our, our sort of newsletter, our website is tough to treat.com. And we don't, we don't, we value your email address. And because of that, we have uh, some clinical Pearl PDFs that I wrote, um, as well as some uh, sleep and persistent pain uh, PDFs that Susan wrote for you when you uh, opt into our email newsletter. And we generally send out, uh, you know, in, in pretty much immediately the PDFs, the clinical pearls, as well as the, the sleep and persistent pain PDFs. There's a, world, a wealth of knowledge in those PDFs. So please hop on tough to treat.com and hop onto the newsletter as, and also I, we, we keep mentioning the search, the search function, but the search function on tough to treat is it, it's a basic Google search function, but you go into the website and you type on the website under the little sort of magnifying glass, any, any, any particular um, region of the body or, or a keyword and all the podcasts that have that word in there, I'm sorry, all the episodes that have that word in there will, will jump up. So I did one recently on low back pain because I was looking for something for somebody and we have so much on low back pain. So I know a lot of you haven't been following us from the beginning. And so we had some fantastic episodes early on as well. So feel free to hop on, on, on that, on that search function and you'll get a whole curated, you know, not a specifically curated list, but you'll get a whole list of episodes that we devoted to your particular topic. Right, Susan? I think it's a yeah, good idea. 100%. Yeah. Don't forget we have our subscription available too at toughtotreat.supercast.com where you get other extras and the opportunity to ask Erica and I anything. And we are happy to answer your questions and do what we can for you. Um, but you just need to jump into the subscription and put your questions and stuff into the portal. Yeah, awesome. So we hope you enjoy this episode. Will it's... Uh, about a squash player and uh, in a very interesting case. So we hope you enjoy it. Hey everybody, it's Erica Mello and Susan Clinton and welcome to episode 131 of Tough to Treat. And in the intro, I had mentioned uh, uh, about the case of about a squash player. So I'm good to go if you are, Susan. We'll yeah, just let's, let's go for it. Okay. The fall, everybody. Exactly. Yes, we finally have some cool weather here in New York. It's in the 60s. And I'm, just, I'm a cool weather person. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a recent patient, actually, 25-year-old um, squash player. You know, not his full-time gig, but, you know, played a lot in college, played pretty, pretty well four years of college, pre-college, and playing now two to three times a week post-college. So a pretty, you know, when he emailed me or contacted me via phone, he's like, I'm an athlete. I'm like, he definitely is an athlete, not a professional one, but he certainly is an athlete with that kind of schedule. Right. And so before I even um, start, um, I want everybody to think about what, what we know about squash players. Like what, what, what do we know? Their movement habits, their movement patterns, right? Susan, what they do. He's right-handed. Um, he was coming into me with low back pain chronic, like persistent, had it on and off, managed it with massage. But what do we know about squash players? And so just think about that in your, in your heads, maybe think about the movement patterning. Um, squash is very dynamic, uh, actually. So just think about that. The guy's 25. He doesn't have a ton of bad habits yet, but he does have a significant movement pattern from the squash. A ton, right? Two to three times a week, college, pre-college. Okay, so it was mostly right-sided low back pain, um, right more than left, basically. And he managed it in college with massage. Typical, you know, college athletes, they don't, you know, I don't think that they get the best of care depending on the college. Um, he was probably division one, I think. However, um, but he managed it, okay? Right now, he used the words, "my I'm tight and immobile. That's what he, that's what he used. And the main issue was walking. 
He could sit no problem. He had a problem. He had a problem walking. Stretching helped him a little bit. Uh, he did wear. He he wears arc supports. He told me, and he had super feet. Now he has a th something called Victory, and so I just noted that down. And he had a minor motor vehicle accident three years prior, some minor whiplash, no concussion. And you know, I think with COVID and the whole pandemic, our times, our time has been, a, our sense of time has been warped. So I'm going to just you give you these dates. But, you know, just think about that because the guy's 25 now. Mm -hmm. Probably about eight years ago, he suffered a right shoulder dislocation from squash. Okay. So pro probably during college, right? And in 2016, so these dates, I think he had the dates wrong, but the first injury was the right shoulder dislocation and also right shoulder impingement, right? Uh, a lot of squash. How did he dislocate his shoulder? Squash. I mean, did he fall on it? Did he? No, it just one of those. He's a. Okay. Just, you know, I'm just using my arms here, but a lot of squash. He did not fall. What I think he may have done is um, he, when, when you're on, when you're with, when you're on the squash court, you're, bump, you're, you're trying not to bump into people. I'll, be, I'll bump into your, your partner, but he, and I watched squash. I belong to a club here in New York that has squash courts and it, it's extremely, you're all over the place, but he didn't fall or anything. So he, he may just be just a like an atraumatic dislocation. He did have a shoulder impingement as well, um, probably shortly there, not shortly thereafter, but in that time frame. So I always say the first injury sort of sets you up and then your movement patterns keeps you mm -hmm. there, right? So his movement patterning is obviously squash. 2016, he sprained both of his ankles right first, then left. That was basketball. And he had a right knee injury, a traumatic, did not know of any specific. It was just probably from squash. It's just his right knee started to bother him. So he did have some physical therapy on the right shoulder, obviously back in the day, and then the ankles and the knees, not so much. So he really managed everything with massage in college. And in terms of any other, you know, medication history, um, you know, I, I always note this because I think it's much more prevalent now is that a lot of people are on you know, antidepressants and anti-anxiety, very common, very, very common. And I I would say 80% of my patient case load is on something like that at this point. Note to self, we just know that that's, that's, that's an issue and much more so now, right? But he's a good coper. He's very active. He continues to play, actually feels that movement makes him feel better. So do you have any questions before I keep going? No, it's just that, you know, just, I was quickly looking um some websites because I am not familiar with squash. Oh, just okay. to see, just to see what the yeah. movement patterns are. There's a lot of stuff out there. So that, you know, the idea is that if somebody's coming in playing a particular sport, it doesn't take much to jump on YouTube and, and take a look at it real quick. Um, you know, to yeah. see that it's a, you know, it's a, it's a diagonal movement at high speed yeah. basically is what I got from it. And so this, you know, but it's interesting that his ankle injuries didn't come from squash. They came from playing basketball. And it was not funny. So, exactly. Cause if you're on, when you're on a squash court, you're literally on your toes. Yeah. You're not, you're on your toes the whole time, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause you're, you're going back and forth, but, and you know, does he wear, you know, the glasses, the goggles, not all the time. I mean, he should, mm -hmm. safe, but he doesn't. Um, but squash is very, very, very dominant. And so very um, dominant movement patterning. And so with him, I did take pictures of him, but even in tennis players, there's a lot of compression in, in, in the upper, upper rib cage, the upper thorax, the shoulders. He did tell me that he was, he's right-handed that the forehand was much harder than his backhand, which makes sense. Cause the forehand mm -hmm. you're, you're doing a lot of sort of, you know, across body compression. And then the, the backhand kind of opens him up a bit. That's much easier for him. So I did have him stand and I took some pictures, normal, narrow, wide stance. I did. Mm -hmm. And you could see on his right, even if I didn't know that he had a right, let's say for, he forgot to tell me about his right shoulder, his scapula was elevated, upwardly rotated. Pro, I mean, his, he was really elevated on his right side, probably from an old, the old injury and his movement patterning with squat just sort of kept him there, right? So that was the first thing that I, I noticed in, in that. And so uh, did that get worse with the feet narrow? A little bit. A little bit, mm -hmm. a little bit. Uh, he was, his center of mass was very much on his right side, which is interesting because that's where his symptoms are, at least in his low back. 
um, and his right knee. His right knee issue never really went away. So in standing normal, narrow, wide, he looked a bit worse with the feet narrow in the sense that his shoulder was more elevated. He was more uh, shifted in his thorax to the right. Mm -hmm. When he went a little bit wider, it felt better. But if you think about squash, squash, you don't really play with, you play with multiple narrow normal wide depending on how you're playing you can stand with the wide stance and squash it'll give you better you know sort of coverage but you're in and out of that movement pattern pretty quickly so moving up to his up to his upper thorax he had all i just got my hands in his armpits just because and i wanted the listeners to know that not everybody has to play a sport for them to have a dominant movement pattern they can be sitting all day and you know you know slumped for, yeah. you know, 10, to, and that's a dominant movement pattern. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who do have people who do play a sport, you know, fairly regularly, you just have to think about what type of movement pattern do they have, you know? And as Susan said, just, you don't know it, just, you don't need to be a squash player to treat a squash player. You just have to go up on YouTube and watch them. You don't need to be a horseback rider to, to treat horseback people who mm -hmm. ride horseback, right? You know that, you know, what the movement pattern. So he had a lot of, I went into his upper thorax, he had a lot of compression under his right shoulder, like in the upper, his upper ribs, very sore through there. And, and that's what I noticed in my standing sort of postural, you know, uh, screen, um, besides the, the scapula and the shoulder issues he did have, because he, he did wear orthotics. I don't, I don't know about you, but if people say I've been wearing orthotics for years mm -hmm. and they're like, should I still wear them? I usually say, well, you know, I, I, I kind of hedge my, usually I say, no, I'm not going to take them away from you unless unless your foot clearly makes everything else worse in your body, mm -hmm. you know, and that will determine from the evaluation. So I didn't say don't take, don't keep them, but he was standing. I mean, don't, don't ditch them. So to speak, he was standing with a, a lot of weight on the outside border of his, of his foot, which makes sense though, with that, with that constant shifting, right back mm -hmm. and forth in squash. So his midfoot was in this sort of externally rotated position, so to speak. Right. Mm -hmm. He was, he wasn't like, he wasn't fanning at all, even in standing. I didn't see, I did have him take his orthotics out of his shoes and that pattern didn't really change. And I put his, I took his uh, orthotics uh, out of the shoes, made him stand in a normal narrow wide in the orthotics and then compared it with the normal narrow wide out of the orthotic. It didn't really change much. Mm -hmm. So I was like, you can kind of, you can keep your orthotics for the time being. Mm -hmm. So do you have any questions? No, I just, I think it's interesting that, you know, again, when you're looking at potential drivers and you're thinking about the feet because you know obviously this guy has had ankle injuries and a knee injury and um some other things did you know what's going on with the feet and looking at them if they have orthotics and shoes what do they normally wear and looking at their movement pattern like just basically you're looking at posture but you're looking at it you know in different positions and then you looked at it without those shoes and you know orthotics on or perhaps yeah. just the orthotics out and did it change if it doesn't change, it's probably not the foot. Maybe. Yes, exactly. You know, probably not. I didn't say not for sure, but probably not. It's like when we get people on their knees, you know, and take the feet out of it completely, what yeah. happens, you know, yes. what, what really gets exposed at that moment. Yeah. And what's interesting is, so for me, I have like, okay, I, I do the little timeline. I put a timeline. I put the days. That's why I think his dates were a little sketchy. Because, you know, he's like, 2012, I hurt my right shoulder. I'm like, you're 25. That's 15. <laughs> I think he was a little off at that point. But so I put a magnet board. So what am I interested in? Obviously, I'm interested in just looking at the low back because that's his pain generator. Obviously, that's where his symptomatic area is. I'm interested in both of his feet just because of his injury history. I am interested in his right shoulder because that's part of his injury history. And I'm also interested in his thorax based on his movement history. So that's just what I want everybody to, to get. It's, you know, his thorax, I mean, based on what I saw, I didn't, I didn't need to take those pictures of him to determine what priorities, shoulder, thorax, feet, low back, knee at the bottom of the list, to be honest. So we, we just came up, uh, upon, uh, since walking really bothered him, that was the main issue. We, I explained to him that I need to assess a movement that is meaningful to you and where I can glean some information. I said, I can watch you squat. That will be not relevant to walking, but I'm happy to watch you. And he's like, no, we can do something else. And so sometimes people are like, oh yeah, you know, some, some clinicians may not have the confidence to assess like a step forward. So you can assess a squat if you want. You may not get as much information, but you certainly can do that um, and do whatever else. Because with him, he had no interest in doing a squat. So I watched him do a step forward. I looked at his left step forward. So left step forward with the right 
heel up in the back and then a right step forward with the left heel. And then I asked him, was one side different than the other? I didn't, I didn't want to like, I just wanted him to answer me because I don't want to say I'm picking this because I see this. He's like, yes, the right step forward was harder. And that's what I saw. So it corresponded. So that's the movement I assessed. So the minute he, cause he has to step and move out when he plays and he has to, and walking was his issue. And you think about walking, what's the base of support with walking? It's fairly narrow, right? So that was a, another clue for me because he's fairly narrow. Um, it, he, you know, he was sore after squash, but that's understandable. Walking was what really got him. So the minute I, I, his center, I looked at his center of mass over his base of support in a step forward. He went right on the outside border of his foot, and, you know, the whole thing, which is, was not, was what I, it was what I was expecting. Cause he stood with a right sort of bias center of mass. When he took a, took a step forward, he even went more to the right, mm -hmm. not symptomatic. He's not going to be symptomatic after taking a couple steps. He's going to have to, you know, he's going to have to walk for a while. So that was the main thing that I saw there. Okay. And because of his history, and I'd be, I'm going to ask your opinion on this as well, because I did a couple things because of his history of, of the shoulder and his upper thorax, you couldn't glean a lot from the shoulder in a step forward, unless he's lifting his arms way above his head. So, and I could see a lot in his thorax there. So I'll, I'll ask you this question, then I'll tell you what I did. I, I did look at a secondary movement because my, the shoulder and the upper quarter was on my magnet board. And I didn't see a ton in a step forward in his shoulder. And so I assessed something else. What would you what would you also have done in that situation? So the, for me, <clears throat> thinking about narrow stance being more problematic and walking being more narrow stance activity, I'm beginning to think a bit of neural tension. And I'm thinking that we're going to have to wind up the upper quarter to like maybe get it to show up. But it mm -hmm. sounds like that he's everything is being pulled to the right because of that. He yeah. he. Um, maybe isn't that much better in, in wider stance, but he's definitely worse in narrow stance. So my thing would be, I need to challenge him in narrow stance a little bit. And um, looking at the, the movement pattern that comes to mind that I would do would be a narrow squat mm -hmm. <clears throat> as the first one or a bend over one of yep. the two. Yep. And watch what his head does. Uh, the other one that would be really, I think, good would be to do, see what he looks like with either his hands on the wall or hands, you know, on his hands and knees. Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. So, yeah, I agree. I did that. I did. I didn't do a bend over. I had him squat initially just to see what I just, that takes five seconds to do. And I didn't see a lot there, but he was like, he was not into it. He wanted me mm -hmm. to look at something in upright with gait. And, you know, for the listeners, you can, as I said, you can look at the squat, you'll glean something, you know, normal, narrow, wide, it's the same yeah. thing. You'll, but he, I, he was just sort of one of those people that was like, I need you to focus on the movement that is important to me. So I was like, okay. So what I did was Susan, I did assess a, just had him do a squat with an arm lift mm -hmm. just to see what it looked like <clears throat> um, in a normal, narrow, wide. And in the wide, in the, in the narrow position, I had him, I said, just, just do me a favor, just squat with a narrow base of support. And just lift your arms up and he had a lot of dysfunction in his right shoulder then i just had him stand with a normal base of support okay and i just had him lift his arm up again and he's like oh it's a, it's a, actually a bit better so what i ended up starting off with um to backtrack i did assess the right step forward and so i started out in his lower thorax i all i did was i put because of the magnet board because of his movement history and because I know what I saw in front of me, I wanted to rule any dysfunction in the thorax out quickly. And I knew I, I didn't think I was going to rule it out, but I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to. And uh, because of the movement patterning, I went into his lower, lower rib cage to start with. Okay. I felt his low back. He had had therapies, like nothing, it's not my back. So he was pretty convinced that it wasn't his back either. So I gave him a little decompression in his, in his uh, lower ribs, like, you know, eight, nine, 10. And I had him step forward. He's like, ooh, that feels different. And whatever, I'm like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Mm -hmm. He's like, it just feels different. I said, okay, step back. I said, lift your right arm up. Like I'm still holding him with the decompression in the thorax. I said, lift your right arm up. 
And Susan, when I tell you, it was so much worse. He's like, oh my God, that's so much harder. It was so much worse. So then I said, okay, I'm not, not letting go. I said, turn your head to the right, turn your head to the left. And it was very, very restricted. Because I did not assess that head movement before I got my hands in there, I said, okay, repeat the head rotation. We know it makes your arm worse. And then I let go. And then I had him do his head rotation to see what it was without my sort of correction. Mm -hmm. It was much better without it. So clearly intervening in that lower part of his thorax would not help the shoulder and it would make the neck, it made the shoulder and the neck worse. So I can't make anything worse on this guy. Right. At right. Least, so, so I moved on. I went up higher into the up higher. Okay. And up like, li like right into the armpits. And because the uh, doing the decompression, in the lower ribs, I didn't look at the feet at that point. Cause I knew that it was making stuff worse. I was not going to waste my time looking at the feet with that particular correction. So I went into the upper rib cage, did the same thing, like ribs four or five. He was very sore, very compressed on his right side, which is what we expect of a right-handed squash player, of a right-handed tennis player. So I went up in there. I said, okay, turn your head. Cause I did not, could not get my hands out of the rib cage. Turn your head. Oh, much better. Turn your head much better. I'm like, okay, we cleared that neck out. Then I said, lift your right arm up better but not a hundred percent. So nothing was being made worse so far. I said, okay, do a heel raise. So now I was going to go to the feet. I go do a heel raise. Mm -hmm. And I did not check that before. So I said, do a heel raise. Oh, that's pretty good. And then I said, okay, do a squat. Cause I wanted to assess his, his, the ability of his feet to fan still was outside. No, still the, the rigidity. I, you know, he was not able to fan the midfoot. He was still squatting with most of the weight on the outside border of his foot. Mm -hmm. I knew that the heel raise was going to be good because that's how he plays. He plays on his toes, basically. Mm -hmm. So I let the, the, I got my hands out of the armpit. I said, do a heel raise. And it was still the same. So no change there, but it wasn't bad to begin with. Yeah. So when I went into the upper, upper trunk, the, the neck was better. The shoulder was partially better. And his left foot was good. His right foot was not, was not, it wasn't better. Left foot was a little mm -hmm. bit better with the squat, but not much better, but he felt better. And I was like, okay, so what do you think I did next? <laughs> I went down into the foot. So he was like, yeah, oh, I, I was going to say, you have to go to the foot next to right. see if changing the foot's going to make things better or make it worse. Right. Right. And so because of the movement, in, the movement history, you know, right now, you know, the shoulder wasn't hundred percent better, but it wasn't worse. So I went to the right, the right, the foot. So I went to the right foot and I just did, you know, lifted his heel up and did some little decompression in the rear foot, had him put, put it down, turn your head to the right, to the left, the same procedure. Okay. So turn your head no, the same, no, no worse. Mm -hmm. Lift your right arm up the same, n mm -hmm. no worse. Okay. No, not better, but just still hard, but not worse. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and I went up into his armpit and I'm looking at him and I did not have a mirror at that time. So he's like, I feel, he goes, cause I feel something funny in my right armpits. So I took my hands out and it was actually making his upper thorax worse. Mm. So the only thing I could think of was, and I'll tell people is like, I had my hands in there and I think what it did, you know, sort of optimizing the the muscular balance, whatever you want to call it, into his foot, got him centered. It got because he was standing, he was biased to the right and standing, biased to the right and a step forward. So when I went in to sort of, you know, decompress the foot, he was able to center himself better, which he did was, but he he was much worse in his upper his upper trunk. So I was like, well. I, this is i'll just say this is what i thought and i'll p pass it on to you i the foot's definitely a player mm -hmm. but it makes things worse right now so mm -hmm. i can't can't treat that foot right today mm -hmm. so i had him lift his right foot up and put it down to take out what i did and i just felt his thorax go boom back to the right so mm -hmm. what it did was it actually centered him but it it made it things worse yeah made things worse so what do you what what are your thoughts? Yeah, on? so my my thoughts are still staying the same that it's you know definitely you know in the upper thorax, <clears throat> but with the stuff that he's feeling under his armpit when he got him centered, 
starts to like you know continue the 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 neural tension but now i'm thinking of more of a dural restriction and yeah. i'm thinking you know even a little higher in the thorax around ct you know that would be where i would be you know heading to for him yeah yeah i mean he's if you look at his I- I pictures he has, and he also, any, I mean, who hasn't had neck pain or stiffness in their life? We all have, mm-hmm. right? So I ask that, I ask that. Like people are like, oh, my neck hurts occasionally. I'll like, okay, that's not dominant. Like for me personally, I have, I have persistent neck pain almost every day. That would be an, an area of the body that people would need to look at, to uh, part, look at on me. With him, it wasn't so much, but, but knowing the, the reason why I brought him up for this case today was because he's a squash player. He has turning his head and up. I mean, you need multiple options for movement in all regions of your body for a sport like that, right? Whereas if you sit on horseback, it's very different, right? Very different loading pattern, very different, more isometric. Whereas in squash, you're very, you're, you, need, you need choices for movement. You need to like grab them on the fly. So what, so what I did was I rechecked his right foot. I said, I need, I need to make, make sure, you know, if it's making him worse. So I actually took a picture again, and just, this was done in a normal base of support. And then I corrected his right foot and then I took another picture and it was definitely worse. And, you know, I, I want to train my hands as well as my vision so I could feel the compression. So I really do think that it just, it got, it got, it got him centered and his body, his upper thorax could mm. not adapt to the new center right. of mass. So this is what I did. And I explained to him the whole sort of theory behind that. And I believe that his upper thorax, his ribs four and five, were probably his primary driver, but did nothing for the foot. And I think that the foot's definitely is probably a very, very, very strong secondary or a dual, um, but it's making his, his other areas of the, especially his upper thorax worse. And so I cannot, if I were just to treat his foot that first visit, I would have made him worse. And so I did not. Mm-hmm. So this is what I did. Um, I gave him three things to do for home. Um, I actually gave him a ball release for his foot. Those are really easy to do. Um, I actually just think he had a really rigid foot. So I felt, I don't think it was like a loss of control. You can't play squash at that level and have poor foot control. <laughs> you know, a lot of it's more, I mean, you can, but it's a lot of it's, it's he's very, is very stiff. So I did tell him to keep his orthotics in. Um, I gave him a ball release for the foot. I actually gave him child's pose and I gave him a kneeling wall squat. Mm-hmm. So I had him I said, take the feet out. We can't, I can't have you doing squats right now because the foot's not treated. So I had him go into kneeling, facing the wall, hands on the wall um, and have him go down into a, um, into a squat. And that's what I gave him for the first visit. I did not look at him um, normal, narrow, wide on the wall, uh, the first visit. Mm-hmm. but I, that is something that people could do. Do you have any, I, I, I have one more session to talk about with him. Do you have any questions on any of that? Um, did he get better? Yeah. So he came back the second, I'm still treating him. So he came back the second visit and he's like, Oh, I feel much better. I'm like, please. <laughs> that always makes me nervous when people say that it honestly does because yeah, I mean, yes, it's a nervous system effect and all. And he's young and is, and he has a ton of, he's very hypermobile and, he did. So the second visit, I'm just looking at my notes, the second visit, uh, he actually played squash after. And here we go. So he, so I asked him about his, I made sure he was doing his movements, his, his, his release of the foot. He d- does them after he plays. And also um, the, the kneeling, the, the child's pose and the squat. So the kneeling wall squat. So he felt li- lighter, he said, and he felt better. So I was, okay. You know, I don't expect miracles, in, but he is young in like one, one session, um, especially with people who've been around the block, you know, and who've had persistent issues, but he definitely was improved. So in my treatment session, the second visit, I reconfirmed everything. Okay. The foot was still making the thorax worse. Okay. I didn't really give him any other exercises to do. I just gave him a foot release and, and mm. do things for the thorax to decompress. So in, 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 this is what I did. I started with the foot. I actually did treated the foot in this session. I did, I treat the foot in four positions in sitting, supine, hook lying and prone. And I just did some release work very quickly, you know, uh, depending on the position. And I had him stand up. Okay. I did some posterior tib release, middle uh, medial gastroc, really, you know, gave him some stuff to do at home. Uh, I had him stand up. I'm like, okay, he's either going to be better or he's going to be worse because I'm treating the foot first. 
but he was not worse. He wasn't better with the thorax. He still was dumped and, you know, his uh-huh. shoulder was still forward, but he wasn't making the thorax worse. I checked his head rotation. I checked his arm lift. They were still at baseline. Cause I, so my thought process was if I treated the rest of his, his thorax first and sent him home with the foot, you know, did the foot treatment last, I didn't want to run the risk of making him worse and then having him go home. So that's why I did the foot treatment first. And then I, I can tell you, I did some, um, some manual therapy to his, you know, his upper thorax. I don't generally do PAs very much anymore, but I did some, some release in sitting and prone on him, got into his armpits. I had to do a ton of breathing, um, lateral costal breathing, diaphragmatic breathing and sitting. I had him when I'm in sit, when he's sitting on the plant, I just get my hands in the armpit. I have him breathe. I have him turn his head. I have him lift his arm up. Any kind of dynamic movement with breathing will help, um, sort of deep decompress that, 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 that right side of my arms were in his hands or in his armpit. So I, I, I don't going to go into the specifics of all that. So t- suffice it to say, I actually did do treat that. I ended up giving him, I have access to Pilates equipment. I did not give him, I did not do that the second visit. Okay. Um, uh, so the manual work was done first to the foot and I continued to give him the ball release. Uh, the, 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 the second time, the, the, the second part of the session, I did a work in his thorax. I grabbed this very easy, easy TheraBand. I had him go supine on the table mm-hmm. with a, a forearm around the, 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 the TheraBand around the forearms. I had him do just, you know, just lifts to the ceiling overhead flexion and skull crushers with my hands on his rib cage, sort of facilitating a better, let's say better, an optimal movement pattern for him. Mm-hmm. I did that. And then, so that was going to be part of his homework. So the second visit, I continued with the, 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 the foot release. I gave him something in on his hands and knees, a ball behind the popliteal fossa and to sit on the ball because that he had some some tone in that upper gastroc that was like a, knee, a kneeling calf release I gave him this time I did give him the wall squats the facing the wall squats with his mm-hmm. hand I told him to stand with a bit of a wider stance just for now because you know he's going to walk out of here out of the office and resort to an old movement pattern so I said look at the end of the day just when you're doing sort of squats in the gym or you're doing any warm just keep your feet a little bit wider than hips width to start he did that and then his theraband mm-hmm that I uh, just spoke about. So he's his, his kneeling wall squats that I gave him the first visit. I told him to use as we talked, as we've talked about before as a reset, mm-hmm. you know, just do that after squash. Uh, but the four things were the, the two releases for the feet and the calf, the wall squats and the yellow TheraBand. Um, so I'll tell you how I, I've not seen him. I'm, I'm waiting. He, I, I haven't seen him since the last visit, uh, cause he's been traveling. So my next visit is going to, I'll tell you, I would progress him and then I'll get your thoughts. My next visit, I'm going to work on, uh, he's, we're going to go to squats. Um, and then he, I'm going to have him do what we call a toe heel raise progression. So we, you walk with one heel up and your back foot heel, heel is up and you step, it's a long story. It's a long progression, but it's called toe heel progression. And it, it works on foot control. I know he'll be okay with that, but I want to see how he does. Um, and I was going to give him this, basically we call them wall lands where you're facing a wall and you land on it and it's sort of half push up and you push off. So, but also wide arms. So wide legs, wide arms. That's how I'm going to progress him. So I'm not seeing him much, but I thought he was an interesting case because of the squash, because of his young age. He's too young to have this chronic back problem, but he plays squash. And so I think, you know, once again, we don't need to know everything about a sport, but we should know by watching it, what regions of the body it stresses. Anyway, I'm going to shut up. I'd love to hear your thoughts. (laughs) Yeah, no, I would have, you know, the wall squats are important. Um, If he didn't have a good sense of midline, I would have taken him to the doorknobs, you know, to use the the, the doorknob as a center, you know, as a midline orientation for him. Um, You know, I think because he does play squash, I think it's important at some point, and I'm sure you've done this, is bring the rotational aspect in. You know, so if those of you who are thinking about what she's doing on the wall, you know, he could have just had the right arm on the wall doing the wall squat. You know, as he progresses, he could have that, you know, the the left arm on the wall as he reaches back with the right arm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, either in standing, can he keep his feet, can his feet move the right way? Like, you know, can he rotate to the left because, you know, his backhand 
<clears throat> is important. Can he get off of the outside, you know, line of his foot as he has his right arm on the wall and rotates to the left and yeah. his trunk, you know, thinking about those movements or the other way, <clears throat> yeah. rotating to the right with his right arm on the wall. Cause that's the, like reverse engineering of the backhand. Yes, exactly. And, you know, being able to bring those in yep. um, are kind of important movements as well. But, you know, definitely working through rotations, eye head, feet, because it's all connected. You know, you oh, want yeah. that long tracking kind of, um, not primitive reflexes, but those movement patterns that are hardwired across diagonals. Yeah. To be sure everything is moving. You know, if the eyes are rotating right and the head's rotating right, what's happening down the rest of the body? Yeah. You know, are they able to do the things they need to do or are they just falling in line by rotating all the way off of the foot? And, mm -hmm. you know, and then when he is trying to walk, it's hard to walk on the outsides of his feet. So he probably is, you know, uh, using the orthotics quite a bit but it takes him into a narrow base of support and if his trunk remains in the position that it is something has to move somewhere and yeah. it sounds like to me that his low back is where the expression of discomfort yeah. has you know come through and it's just probably you know maybe the little joints in the back just aren't real happy about having that level of compression or side bending Exactly. wherever he you know for chronic walking for long-term walking but yet he can run and bounce and that's very different than just walking which is you know just that walking is such a spinal cord movement activity yeah. you know and squashes you're on your toes you're doing all this stuff and he can compensate and and he can do these things because he's not just staying in a narrow base of support over and over and over and over and over again. Right. Exactly. Like if he was a golfer and putting and, you know, that's different. That's very narrow. Right. Yeah. But, you know, it was interesting with him is that, you know, you could with people like that, you can you, you, it's only your creativity that limits you in this program because you can change his feet position you know, normal, narrow, wide arm position, normal, narrow, wide, you, uh, you know, a, asymmetrical on the wall, one hand above the other, you know, like it, you, that's in a closed chain pattern, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, he needs to be able to rotate, you know, and the forehand is hard for him. So that's sort of this left rotation, right? So, you know, people who are sort of stuck with exercise, you want to think about, uh, you know, what movement pattern is predominant and what does he need to get out of? And, Rotation is definitely something, but you want to think about because he has a secondary issue in his foot, you absolutely need to vary his foot position, you know, yeah. when, right? When you 100%. Eating. And I think the other thing is if his forearm or his, but I, I'm bad with these terms, but I guess when he's going forward with the squash racket versus a backhand, yeah, forehand, I guess it is. I don't know what the right term is. If he's on the outside border of his foot and he stays on the outside border of his foot, that's going to limit the amount of rotation and movement he's going to have up the chain to have a much stronger forearm. Exactly. You know, and so that has to be looked at. So, you know, with he's when he's doing that, he may, you know, and the, the, the thorax may be limiting the foot motion, the foot motion may be limiting the thorax, who knows? But he, he needs to be able to come off of the lateral border of his foot in order to be able to give enough rotation and power through the system and if he's not doing that he's having to gain that somewhere else yeah yeah and, <clears> I, and he can get away with it at 25 but you know he said i'm better with a backhand than i am with a forehand forearm yeah. you know, with a forehand or whatever they call it I think um, you know and it makes and it makes sense because if he's over there all the time and he's already shifted right how is he going to ever overcome and come out of that to move you know to, to rotate left right no no, it's going to be, he has to put so much more force through his forehand and he, and that's the problem. He's just, that's where he's getting, you know, and I think it's just trickled down to his low back. And I agree with you. You're, yeah. you know, you're, you're trying to, you know, no matter how great an athlete you are, you consistently hit off balance. Something's going to give at some point. Yeah. And you said when point. you got in there and, and worked through the, the thoracolumbar junction, lower rib area, it made everything worse. Okay. So he's probably over, trying to over rotate or overcome the loss of mechanical ener energy that he's not gaining because he's already over on the right. So he's not getting any more mechanical in, you know, energy built up. By, mm -hmm. you know, even going further to the right before he comes to the left with a forehand yep. or forearm, yeah. <clears throat> it's going to have to happen somewhere. He's going to have to, you know, pull in a lot of effort somewhere else to make that happen. Yeah, and, exactly. You know, and again, he's young. He can rely on, you know, muscular, you know, muscular force to do that, but it's not sustainable in the long run. And, you know, it's showing up by, you know, limiting his ability to do 
simple movements that you know just require the same movement pattern over and over again because he's yeah. kind of grinding into that lumbar spine with yeah. some of the other stuff because of the lack of movement yeah and the other pieces you know in his foot and and up above in his and his upper thorax yeah and so i i always so, think that you know even if patients you know I, I ask my patients about injuries i don't know some people have you know forms they send out but you need to ask your patient about injuries because this right shoulder issue probably set him up you know years ago when he was mm -hmm. you know pre college and he just compensated around it and you know then he had the foot issue so don't you know it, it is very common that to have prior injuries as primary issues or, or what's driving their current issue you know short, short of an acute an acute mm -hmm. uh, symptom so it would be it would it, it would be behoove everybody um the listeners to really go back to some of their patients who've been struggling look at their first injury ask them about an injury probably people don't tell you everything they just forget you know mm -hmm. so think about that and maybe that's an area that could you know once treated may take the patient to where they need to go you know so yes and i also think it's important to step out of the regional approach you know mm -hmm. going after his low back was not going to be helpful for him no. <clears throat> but looking at the full movement pattern the same thing when he had his shoulder rehabbed you know how do you integrate that movement pattern that the shoulder needs to do back into the full movement pattern of the body? Yep. yep. And, and that may be where the foot might've come in, yep. you know, like, okay, well, your shoulder is better, but every time you do this, you're still way over here. So you're not, you know, you're still, you're, the, the compens compensatory movement pattern is still dominant. We've got to get that to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Agreed. I Thank agree. you for this. This is good. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's enjoyable. I will keep everybody posted as to his progress. And um, yeah, it's, 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 it's always these young kids keep you on your toes. <laughs> let, let me tell you. Um, we hope everybody enjoyed and we will see you on the next episode. Yes. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.